Welcome to Planet the Climates. Planet the Climates is a community organized podcast bringing you the latest information and insight into the Klima DAO ecosystem. Klima is a blockchain protocol backed by carbon credits that's fighting climate change by giving people an opportunity to offset their own carbon footprint and get rewarded to do so. Klima sits at the intersection of cryptocurrency, game theory, and the carbon credit markets, so there's no shortage of great stuff for us to talk about. My name's Phaedrus, I'll be your host on this adventure, and as usual, I'm joined by my good friends and co-hosts Diamond Hands, Klima, and Reg, as we discuss the latest Klima news, drop some occasional alpha for you, and connect you with the brightest and biggest names currently exploring this space. Diamond Hands, Klima, and Reg, why don't you take a minute and tell us a little bit about why you're pumped about our guest today, Joseph Pallant. You know, we're not experts on carbon markets to make a <laughs> to make an understatement, but we're actively learning about it. I think a lot of people in the Klima ecosystem are learning about it. And Joseph Pallant is an expert. Yeah, he's been doing it for 17 years and he has been doing it at the intersection of crypto. So I think we're going to learn a lot. For sure. How about you, Diamond Hands? We actually first got him in Klima's uh, office hours. He shared a lot of insights about carbon credits and the carbon market and of course, for us at Plan of the Climates, we have to have him on our show and, you know, to really dive even deeper into, like, you know, the carbon markets, what's the future of the carbon markets and what future holds for Klima, uh, what position we will have in the carbon market. So that's what I'm really excited about, to, to dive deeper to and to increase my knowledge about carbon markets and see what he has to say of what Klima will be in the future. Definitely. Yeah, Planet the Climates bringing the A-list guests nonstop for sure. Um, <laughs> so my own little little story about why I'm pumped about having Joseph uh, Pallant on the show is kind of right after I took part in the uh, LBP liquidity bootstrapping process for Klima. You know, uh, Klima was going through a process of trying to, you know, gather credits on chain to kind of bond and become that uh, BCT, bring uh, bridge that carbon on chain. And I was just reaching out to an old friend of mine and saying, you know, who should I talk to if I want to learn more about, you know, carbon markets or what we could bring on chain at Klima? And he said, oh, you can want to check out uh, Blockchain for Climate Foundation and the uh, executive director there, Joseph Pallant. So I came back to the Discord server and had a little chat with uh, Dionysus there and said, what about this guy, Joseph Pallant? Maybe he could help steer us in the right direction. And he said, oh, well, guess what? Uh, Joseph is already an advisor. He's tight with us already here at Klima. So for me, that was, you know, the number one kind of bullish signal that I could possibly get. And I'm so hyped to uh, have a chance to chat with Joseph here on the show. But yeah, enough about us, enough about the show. Let's just uh, jump right into it. So Joseph Pallant is our guest on this episode of Planet the Climates podcast. He's not only a proud climate, but also the director of climate innovation at Ecotrust Canada and executive director of the Blockchain for Climate Foundation based in Vancouver, Canada. Blockchain for Climate's vision is putting the Paris Agreement on the blockchain. And if you're wondering just what that means or how it's happening, you're in the right place. Joseph has become a recognized expert in international carbon markets. And with Blockchain for Climate, he's paving the way for rapid acceleration of nations addressing and hopefully meeting their carbon commitments. Joseph, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. No doubt we're all about to get schooled in ITMOs, BITMOs, Article 6, and so much more. But to get us started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your journey? What's your background? And when did the idea of mashing up carbon markets and cryptocurrency first hit your radar? Thanks so much. I'd be delighted. So my journey started quite a ways back. I started working in carbon markets back in October 2004, and I've been doing it essentially nonstop since then. And uh, so those those years have added up, and it was really quite a treat to get going in a sort of early mid part of the carbon market and carbon offset development space. There were lots of amazing projects to do and not a lot of infrastructure. So helped build first of offset methodologies, also known as protocols, worked on getting projects, real projects done, trees in the ground, trees protected, um, also worked in 
um, fuel switching and renewable energy type projects, and really just sort of building the tooling to enable what we think of as a carbon market with the really clear belief that we need uh, a tool that combines, it's an economic tool that is fundamentally pay for performance. So the rigor of offsets is really quite wild. Like in so many things in life, you get paid on a variety of uh, performance measures. But with offsets, it's did you or did you not get and keep carbon out of the atmosphere that you can prove to a specific standard and and then by bringing that to market. And so really love that diligence and uh, see it as an important way for people who care about the climate or people who are forced to care about the climate through regulation or compliance markets um, to be able to efficiently get their money into the hands of people that are best placed to get and keep carbon out of the atmosphere also ideally enable the social and environmental co-benefits from that work. Uh, so it it really rests on this environmental asset of a carbon offset, and it's a really good primer for tokenization, spoiler, spoiler alert, because we're pulling all this information together. We are taking one, you know, each big project and boiling that down into a whole bunch of sort of characteristics and quality characteristics but then at the end of the day conveying all of that and conveying the benefit of all of that in one ton increments and so in the spring of 2017 when i was reading an article on ethereum and icos uh it just made sense in an instant um and I was really excited about the funding model of ICOs because, once again, the diligence of offsets is quite severe sometimes in that you have to get and keep that carbon out of the atmosphere, prove it, do all the documentation and papering before you get your first carbon money. And uh, so other ways to fund that up front was really interesting from the ICO point of view. That, of course, you know, kind of had an ignomus end. Um, and then the other aspect really was creating environmental assets and having a new tool to take these already really quite ready to roll environmental assets of a carbon offset and plugging that into blockchain. And I'm sure we'll get a lot of a chance to talk about that. But I think it kind of there's a bit of a clima and, and toucan vibration there, too, right? Because here are these new really powerful, innovative tools that are, you know, they're they're standing on the shoulders of giants. They are resting on the work that's been done to date in putting together a carbon market, putting together, you know, the hard work that the Vera Standard folks have done over the last 15 plus years, and then all of the work that project developers have done to get and keep carbon out of the atmosphere, document it, turn it into carbon credits, and then we have this these amazing tools to come whisk it away tokenize it as base carbon tons at Toucan, and then inject it into the Klima, Klima DAO, making Klima tokens, um, and making the whole flywheel run. So yeah, that was a very exciting, obviously, to sort of land on it. And um, I, I can go on about that, <laughs> if that's a good fit. Sure, yes, please do. So I will there. And after spending a lot of 2017 looking around at the different things that people were doing, the different thoughts that were occurring to me around how we could marry blockchain and, and climate and the carbon market. Um, one of the things that struck me was a lot of the projects that were coming to the fore were either asking the wrong question or trying to answer questions we'd already answered in the carbon market. And the one thing that really stuck out for me was the possibility of building tools on the blockchain to enable Paris Agreement carbon markets to move ahead. So this was 2017, so it was like a year and a half since the Paris Agreement was agreed upon. And in that there is this part called Article 6, which talks about the creation of a global carbon market, uh, both sort of a sovereign side of that, as well as a kind of a clean development mechanism 2.0. Um, so uh, a re a revamp and a re roll of the international carbon markets that have happened in the past, um, as well as Article Six Point Two with sort of new um, sovereign tooling to it, and so this was of course the holy and that's not the holy grail, but it is a massive major leap forward. Why would we want these things? Why would we want international carbon markets plugged into the sort of you know the main the main the main line of of 
sort of climate negotiations and the commitments that were made in Paris and that continue to be met or made rather and and that we're really hoping to be able to meet. Okay. And what what I saw was that we still had a significant way to go to getting these markets operational and the one thing that really jumped out was that there are specifics to the to the article 6 around the type of architecture needed to make sure that there's no double counting and that if one country issues a, a carbon credit that you remove those emission reductions off of its account off its balance sheet and you're transferring them you're conveying them to someone else and without going too far into detail there we saw that it was going to take you know people were saying it would take at least 3 years to build that off blockchain and that they wouldn't start doing it um, sort of in the UN space until Article 6 was agreed upon. And so Article 6 actually just got agreed upon a couple of weeks ago. And so we saw that rather than building, um, or not rather than, but maybe to supplement or to stand in, 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 you know, in the early days of and to get this market moving faster, could we build a platform where national governments could issue and exchange their Article 6 Paris Agreement carbon credits? And um, and that got us away to the races. So yeah, a, a lot there for sure. And let me just plant a flag for our listeners here too. We've talked a lot about carbon markets and you've just, you know, again, talked about Article 6, the implications there. Can you just back up for a second and explain at a really high level, what is a carbon market? What does that mean? Who Who are the buyers? Who are the sellers? And what is that difference between a voluntary market versus a compliance or regulatory market? Absolutely. So carbon market is usually referring to the notional space where people are creating, buying, and selling carbon credits or carbon offsets. Mm -hmm. Carbon offsets are a specific type of carbon credit. I think that they're the ones that most of us are would be familiar with or listeners might be familiar with. Um, they're proven emission reduction outcomes that are additional to business as usual, so they wouldn't have happened if they weren't a carbon offset. Their emission reductions are quantifiable, and they are then verified in those outcomes. And those emission reduction or removal outcomes also have to be permanent. Or in the case of hmm. uh, landscape-based stuff, we consider a 100-year permanence to sort of be, be the bar, because we're going to need to have this solved well by then. And so the difference between compliance slash regulatory credits and voluntary credits, there's two main differences, I would say. And one is around who sets the rules for what counts as a carbon credit. And the other is who are the users of the carbon credit. And so in the voluntary market, we have uh, a whole range of amazing standards like VERA and the voluntary carbon standard that's nested within that. We have the gold standard, we have American Carbon Registry, uh, and then a variety, ISO, a var variety of other voluntary standards there. And in that case, there's usually a board that's come together that's part of this standard, um, and this buck sort of stops with them. Within the organization, they do the work to either establish or if not establish, definitely quality check and gatekeep the methodologies that are used to create the carbon credits. And so the rules are sort of set in a variety, kind of a tightly packed variety of ways um, by people who've gone and said, we are going to set up a standard. And I think a lot of people have done that over time. And there's definitely been some attrition and settling on you know, a smaller number of high quality offset standards. And the users of voluntary offsets are much more varied in in scope, I would say. So it can be anyone from an earnest individual who wants to offset their carbon footprint. It can be a company that wants to have environmental social good impact. Um, they just really want to help save the planet. They want to help deploy capital in an efficient way to get and keep carbon out of the atmosphere. And then you sort of work your way up. You can have people trying to do it as sort of a marketing and engagement type thing. The whole nine. You can also have it injected into DeFi and spun into an amazing DAO and the DAO tokens. All sorts of users there. Well, we like that. <laughs> yes, we do. As a matter of fact. And yeah, and I'm even doing it short shrift. Like um, the voluntary market is a pretty amazing, profound thing. And I think what's so cool about the voluntary market is it's enabled so much 
uh, experimentation and learning and doing and refinement of these tools. Like I got started 17 years ago um, and it's come an awful long way. And one thing I will say in, in support of the voluntary carbon market is that, you know, I think the tons that the offsets that are getting created these days and over the last big chunk of time to these high quality standards are really profound environmental assets that really have gotten or kept carbon out of the atmosphere. There's also making sure that there's permanence buffers. So in the case of natural climate solutions projects, um, which I think are the best things in sliced bread, um, there is a potential for reversal um, for there to be a fire or a flood or wind blowing stuff down. And so what we do is we design projects to be as resilient and, you know, effective and, and um, accurate in what is likely to happen over over the um the intervening years but then we also will take a buffer so say it's 10 percent or 30 percent or 50 percent um where there is and that's assessed sort of on a statistical risk to that something happening to that carbon and we set that aside it gets held a number of different ways um to make sure that 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 carbon is always whole or that carbon credit is always made whole yeah, I guess my, my takeaway from what you were just saying there, Joseph, too, is that the the bar is pretty darn high for these credits, isn't that right? I mean, we, I think we at, at Klima here, we've you know perhaps heard a little bit about like, oh, these are older credits, or oh, we're you know sweeping the floor, or just it's the cheaper credits. Can you maybe talk a little bit about like what that bar, or the hurdle is that people have to get over to get a credit issued in the first place? Absolutely. And yeah, I realized I sort of dropped out partway through the answer, which is to get a carbon offset to these standards is a really big deal. It's rigorous. It takes years. Anything that's been verified through the VCS, Verified Carbon Standard and VERA, um, which is what Toucan and Klima use, are a very solid environmental asset. It's really profound. And a big part of my work has been developing these projects. And I've I've developed an unsuccessful project to the verified carbon standard where it was worked on for years and years and years and millions of dollars spent on it and there were two key elements to it that um, weren't able to get solved and weren't able to be sort of addressed by the, the project developer and so it failed and we got zero carbon credits and that's as it should be so i'm i'm very tangibly aware of the work that it takes to do that can i ask a quick question about the voluntary market. Uh, I know it's not your focus currently, but we're all here to learn and uh, you know a lot more than we do. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, different types of assets. So uh, for example, there's um, assets focused on uh, plastic removal from the ocean. Uh, there's carbon um, sequestration projects of different qualities. If you could give us just a little more background. This is where I'm kind of a little bit old school. I get accused of being old school or curmudgeonly, um, and I will own that. I think that that's fair. I try to, you know, hold that role as as, as gently and as generously as possible. But um, if things are not issued to a carbon offset standard, um, and I'm aware that there, you know, there will be more great standards created. That's not all said and done around the existing standards, but it's kind of like. Um, what is it? Exceptional. There's some quote around exceptional claims need exceptional evidence. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that may have great benefit to the climate, um, that may have great benefit to our beautiful oceans, may have good, profound social and environmental impact. But if they are not meeting the good practice guidance and working through these fairly well-established tools and rules of a carbon offset, they are not creating a carbon offset. And yeah, I suppose I was lumping in this with voluntary, but that may not be accurate. Well, it's not a voluntary offset. It's a voluntary Correct, yeah. something else. And it's amazing right. for people to be innovating on these other environmental assets um, and where you can create a good, logical, clear, provable environmental asset. I am super gung ho for that. Um, but I do think it's quite important to really differentiate between the two. Um, so you know, I, I can't say exactly where it will go. I think a lot of these things will raise a lot of money, will do a lot of good. I get um, 
frustrated or just sort of look sideways at things that are claiming a carbon benefit um, or even claiming to sort of create a unitized carbon benefit, but that are not following an established functional standard for proving that they actually are additional carbon offsets. Here's my question, right? So now we talk about standards and everything. Then, then this brings me to a question that I'd like to ask uh, Joseph, uh, which is I'm going to jump right into Bitmos, right? Bitmos is something that um, a lot of people have been talking about. Uh, personally, I, I'm being very honest with you. I'm a noob when it comes to carbon credits and uh, the carbon market. And this has been, a, by far, so far, has been a very insightful conversation with you. Me being a fly on the wall and listening to all these things, like, wow, that's like, a, <laughs> I feel like I'm getting a, a diploma, a degree in carbon markets, man. Like, it's really amazing. But I, w- I really want to jump into like Bitmos, right? Like, maybe can you give us a bit of, uh, maybe a, like a simpler explainer, like what Bitmos is all about? Absolutely. So, Ooh, this this could go for hours. What's the fundamental? So maybe leaving some of, well, no, I'll go from there. So BITMO, we have taken the technical term for a Paris Agreement Article 6 carbon credit, um, ITMO, or Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcome, and we've thrown a cheeky B on the front to make it Blockchain Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcome. Um, and to boot, it's got BIT, um, so that's nice for for the blockchain. And ITMOs are these credits that are going to be created either through Article 6.2 or Article 6.4 of the Paris Agreement. As I mentioned, 6.4, it's a lot more closely, you know, if you know what carbon offsets are, or even Kyoto Clean Development Mechanism carbon offsets, it's kind of recreating that system in this, you know, now that we're in the 20s. With Article 6.2, it's a whole new beast, and it has gotten significantly more defined in the last couple of weeks with the passing of Article 6 rulebook at at, um, at Glasgow COP. Fundamentally, Article 6.2 ITMOs are carbon credits that national governments basically are creating or are collecting from having been created within their country. And I, you know, I use blessing for use, certifying for use, but it's kind of almost blessing in, in a lot of cases where it says, we say that these count as a carbon credit as an ITMO. We are willing to have them be moved out of our country and off of our books and onto somebody else's. And what's really fascinating about ITMOs, Article 6.2 ITMOs, is that there's a quite a wide degree of national sovereignty around what counts as an Article 6.2 ITMO. And so some countries are going to have higher standards and some are going to have notionally lower standards. And whether that's better or worse, we'll sort of see. But one of those fundamentals is that ITMOs are going to, Article 6.2 ITMOs are going to take kind of a variety of shapes and sizes, if you will, um, which is sort of rare for one system um, like Article 6.2 or like the Paris Agreement carbon markets. Um, And so these credits will have different, um, uh, what's the word, characteristics um, that they can be sorted by, that they can be discussed and understood by, um, and importantly in BITMOs, that they can be um, tokenized and carrying information. So one of the things that really set us on the path to the Bitmo platform and Blockchain for Climate Foundation um, was the sort of late 2017 unveiling of CryptoKitties by Axiom Zen um, here in, in Vancouver. And so I was, we were in the space then and we had this really neat, literally underground cryptocurrency members club um, in downtown Vancouver called uh, Decontrol. And um, it was it was literally underground, and we had some of the Dapper Labs crew um, come and show us this. And we had a couple hour demo from them, and they would have to like hop off and deal with something like blowing up in the system and everything. But it was pretty profound because this was only like less than a week into their launch, so we were in early enough to get lots of crypto kitties, but maybe not out quick enough once it sort of shut down the Ethereum blockchain. But what blew my mind and really clarified how in the heck we would put Paris Agreement on the blockchain um, was these NFTs. And right away saw that, because up till then, we were having to do this in the mental construct of ERC-20s, where you could have a pool of a portfolio of different quality carbon credits or different carbon credits, but you couldn't really differentiate one from the other. 
And what makes a carbon offset valuable fundamentally is its paper trail or its digital trail and knowing all of the quality characteristics, being able to understand all this. And so just didn't really sit quite right with me that it had to go all into a pool and it left us a little bit like we kind of were partway there towards an idea, but still couldn't really see how we would put, you know, the Paris Agreement, Article 6, with, you know, if we're going to be successful, there need to be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of projects getting and keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, every country of the world. And so pooling all this into one pool was was really not going to cut it. Um, and so seeing the eye shape of a crypto kitty and think we can put project name there looking at um hair color and say we can put carbon vintage there that was really the other foot to fall and enabled us to sort of get moving in this vision and so at first it was just erc721 then we had our collaborator matt lockyer who sort of wrote ERC-998, which was around composability. So we started to get there for how we could pack more credits into one. So I'm kind of arcing on the question of what are Bitmos. No, that's awesome. This is well, we, can, we can pause there for a second yeah. because I think a lot of people are going to become familiar with the ERC-1155 standard when the metaverse sort of, you know, fully gains altitude uh, in terms of popularity. Um, but, you know, this is you're almost like front running it with your application to Bitmos. Could, could you take us through, you know, what our ERC, what is the ERC 1155 standard? Yeah, what does it allow you to do that a standard NFT, the current protocol uh, doesn't? Absolutely. So in that arc, you know, 998 got us, you know, thinking in another, you know, an additional direction where you could have one token on a bunch of other tokens. But really where the other foot fell was with ERC 1155. And so um, I still call it a non-fungible token. Some people derisively call it a semi-fungible token, but um, it's an NFT to me. And so how you can think about this is with an ERC 721, they are minted one at a time. And so you mint this, this NFT and it acts like an NFT that you have in your wallet. And the tricky part is each mint, you got to pay the minting fee. And every time you move one, you got to pay the transfer fee. What 1155 allows us to do is do one issuance of, there's probably like 18 zeros or whatever, but you know, a more or less unlimited number of identical, though differentiable NFTs. And they so you can print a whole bunch of them that are all essentially identical though you can tell them apart by sort of their serial number in a sense but that was amazing because what we want to do is tokenize issuances or tokenize verifications really so you go you do your carbon credit um an auditor comes and looks at all the work you've done over this last year and all the productivity of your forest or your renewable energy or whatnot and says okay this year you've achieved a million tons of carbon benefit. So that's just how carbon market works. And so then you can bring that, and rather than having to do one million individual tokenization um, activities, you can do it all in one, get this stack, and then I can send one away, or I can send 450,000 away, uh, or I can send a million away. It's easy peasy, just type it in. And so this has really been the sort of token tooling necessary for us to have exactly what we've always dreamed of. Um, and um, from time to time, it'll come up. I'm very, I'm a, a real, I'm a, it's like an Ethereum maxi, but really it's just, I have a deep love and appreciation for Ethereum. And a big part of it was, is, you know, back in 2017, we were going to have to invent a lot of the stuff to bring this use case to, to ground ourselves. And over the years, the community did it. And, you know, I think we see this in Klima, where folks like yourselves, like so many other climates, are are digging in, putting their skill sets to use and creating stuff, you know, more useful and more beautiful than we could have ever imagined or ever hoped for when we set off on the journey. And so Ethereum's kind of done that for me. Um, I consider its L2s as Ethereum as well for my maximalism. So I'm just really appreciative of that. And we have built the Bitmo platform on Ethereum. And kind of quickly, some of the reasons for that, because people will ask that, is A, we've been building it for a while. And so there is some aspect of we've been building it for a while and, and you know, staying on that course. Um, another is really for the network effect. So Ethereum already has, you know, all of the decentralized exchanges, central exchanges, 
you know, DeFi tooling, all these amazing things. And so this is all there rather than trying to build on sort of a non-Ethereum based or, or L2 type of structure. A big part of the success of Blockchain for Climate's work in the Bitmo platform that we haven't really talked about was that we actually also need national governments to come on board and to agree and choose to use the Bitmo platform to issue and exchange their Paris Agreement Article 6.2 ITMOs as Bitmos. And so it's hard enough, you know, talking to people, it's getting a lot easier now, but it's still hard to talk to people not in the space about blockchain and you, you mean bitcoin right so ethereum is kind of there like ethereum you know i hear it on the radio people kind of get that and so there is an aspect and i don't know if this is like at all degen or even you know a really good reason but it's it's more clear to explain to people that we're building on ethereum the other part is is that and i think that klima has really blown a hole in this reasoning is that We've always considered, and I believe that the carbon market has always felt that Article 6, the kickoff of the global carbon market on Article 6, especially 6.2, is going to be kind of slow. So I think that there's a general sentiment that it's going to be national governments creating credits and selling them to other national governments. So a sort of bilateral agreement, it's going to be large, you know, large stacks, so large numbers of tokens or, or tons, and a smaller number of transactions. And so you know, you can pay the gas on Ethereum if you're transacting a million dollars worth of value or, uh, you know, a billion dollars worth of value. What has kind of blown us away and been really impressive with Klima um, and significantly enabled by using Polygon, aka Matic, was a consumer, well, it's kind of consumer on steroids, consumer on Big King Kong consumer, um, where there are everyday people that are tokenizing their, you know, they're getting vera tons and retiring those tokenizing those through toucan and injecting them into the system so we're on ethereum for now i think it's going to be a good fit for now we'll see what other aspects are added to the puzzle over time and also you know super big fan of of polygon have got to learn to use it being in the climate ecosystem it is quite magical in its cost effectiveness um, and ability to let everyone engage yeah no argument there yeah <laughs> You, you spoke about use use cases, right? And I, I want to give uh the listeners a little bit more about like what are the possible use cases on B, uh for Bitmo on chain. Uh, that's one the first question. But the second part, which is the main question that I really love to ask, is what sort of uh because like essentially what we're trying trying to do is to increase the cost of pollution, and what sort of uh, resistance or pushback do you expect from the industry? Uh, because of what we are doing right now? Yeah, great question. So it's a good from the earlier preamble about the sort of expected uses is that there will be large national that national governments will issue an exchange buy and sell it um itmos, um, hopefully as bitmos. Then the next sort of hierarchical use case down that I also see is I have no evidence for this, but I expect that national governments, certain national governments, along with their sovereign purchases of ITMOs, will also allow their uh, emitters in their country to use international carbon credits towards some portion of their compliance. Um, so all large emitters in Europe, for example, are part of the EU emissions trading system. Um, right now, you know, it has its own dynamic. Um, but I believe in the future, there will be so basically large industrials coming to the market to buy ITMOs. And I don't think that that's that radical. Like, I think that's, that, that's not that radical. What I think will also happen, and once again, Klima is really, you know, the many ton uh, monkey in the room. You know, I think that there's going to be a voluntary demand for it to a certain extent. And I think it remains to be seen how many people want to buy an ITMO, how many people want to buy a voluntary carbon credit that's not an ITMO. There's a whole fascinating world there around do voluntary offsets actually need to be itmatized? Do they need to be turned into ITMOs? And, you know, jury's out. Different people are sort of arraying in their own battle stations or, or trenches around that discussion. I don't have a firm position on it. But what I do see is that where voluntary offsets are not itmatized and hence being taken off of their country of origins carbon footprint kind of as a benefit because they're an emission reduction outcome 
then your the country, their host country, is actually going to be able to claim the benefit of those credits in their national accounting. So for example, I'm in Canada. If I were to you know, take tons of emission reduction outcomes from our Chequemus Community Forest Offset Project, which is a great project that we developed um, with EcoTrust Canada and Brinkman Climate, and then Squamish Nation, Lil Watt Nation, and Resort Municipality of Whistler. Um, mm. If we took 10 of those tons and we use that to, to offset, you know, my personal emissions for the year, but if those emission reduction outcomes were still being can- counted in Canada's carbon footprint, which is a bit of a, a muddy question, but if they were, then Canada is still, Canada hasn't had to do 10 more tons of emission reduction outcomes. They're actually able to use my 10 tons towards their national compliance. And so you can see how if people are wanting to, you know, reduce their emissions and reduce their emissions more than their country was otherwise, you know, they're not fine to just let their country deal with it, then that does make quite a strong case for the need to itmatize the voluntary market. Um, so that's that's a small tangent on that. I think that you know the questions of other uses of of Bitmos on chain really then obviously rounds this rounds the curve into DeFi, and uh, you know Klima once again um, is quite a profound example of this. You can use it to back a, a carbon back cryptocurrency. You can use it to buy a cryptocurrency. So you fundamentally at the end of the day by Klima in BCT and even though it, it, it ports you know through that from USDC for example um, but uh, so then okay we're buying things with with carbon offsets um, I think somebody just recently announced I saw it on Twitter that it was the first NFTs that you bought with um, with carbon credits I think they use BCTs um, so that's very cool so you know, anything in the magical world of DeFi, um, you know, use it for, you know, you can stake it, you can bond it, you can lend it. So all those things. And and I will also say one other quick crypto piece is um, I, I think you can use it with NFTs. So we saw a really neat thing in the Ocean Drop this week where Klima tokens are embedded into an NFT. Sven Everwine's NFT. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And so... This has actually got that has got a really a bunch of layers of meaning because it's also sort of the last staker. Um, mm-hmm. uh, other people will explain that dynamic better, but it's quite profound that um, there will always be, and you can never remove those staked klima from that system. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that isn't squarely in the category of like this is more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. <laughs> um, yeah. I do think that even in a simple sense that backing nfts with with bcts or with other tokenized offsets potentially with bitmos in the future is really exciting because you can layer in you know that social that environmental that community benefit with carbon offsets and i think it's just a great fit for for nfts for art for the way people are are doing good um like doing good (laughs) in this space um so a lot of really pretty profound uses for for carbon credits on chain. I think in terms of industry pushing back, you know, it, it, governments governments are incentivized to maintain the cost of pollution at a certain level so they meet their uh, targets like the EU, I believe. I don't know the dynamics of it, but they have a fund where basically they can use it to manipulate the price of their compliance credits. And so with a, a new buyer coming in, it perhaps takes some of the pressure off them to maintain the price. And so I could see governments being fully in favor of Bitmos and uh, the actions of Klima. Well, I know that I know that Archimedes really wants to buy the first Bitmo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. That's good for news. That's good news for us. Yeah, I, I, I hope I hope people don't let him do it. You know, without a fight. Um, but um, I. You know, I don't immediately see that. I don't see Klima as being the the major hold, you know, the biggest holder of Bitmos um, over time. There is going to need to be billions and billions of of Itmos created, and uh, we hope that we can, you know, manage and process and enable a major portion of that, if not all. Um, but it doesn't need to be all. Are you guys owning? Are you is the Blockchain for Climate Foundation? going to be providing essentially the market for Bitmos 
And uh, I guess, what are the trading pairs that you're looking at? Or is it literally just trading BitMOs? Is it an exchange for USDC? Or what? can you just kind of walk us through that? This is a great question. So I think that you can think of us as sort of our ambition in enabling the market. The uh, critical path led through taking something from off-chain and bringing it on-chain. And as part of that process, providing the architecture necessary to get to kickstart Article 6 sooner rather than later. If you think about it, actually, we we don't actually ever own the Bitmo, at least in the way we have stuff set up right now. And so what we do is we whitelist the relevant national party. And this is kind of how the off-chain and on-chain trust happens is there, you know, there are named individuals that are in charge of their country's engagement with the Paris Agreement. And so we can, you know, they can tell us their public address for their Ethereum wallet. And then we whitelist them in their sis- in our system. And then they are able to issue uh, Bitmos. And this has to be this way because Article 6.2 ITMOs, BITMOs can only be issued by national governments. So they issue it and then it goes right back into their wallet. And so really we are doing that tokenization work for them. And at the simple, most fundamental level, that's that. At, at a high level, you, you know, our, our community understands what Toucan does. Would you kind of see an analogy in terms of the compliance markets between what Toucan does and what you're, you're doing with BITMOs? Absolutely. And they, they do it so very elegantly for their work and are a great vision of, of how to do that in a really crisp way. Um, but yeah, I think that's a very apt comparison. And do you see Klima, how do you see Klima acquiring uh, Bitmos uh, and incorporating their treasury? Do, is that yeah. a possibility? Oh, absolutely. So I think from there, it'll be up to national governments how they want to provide these to the market. I do know that in a lot of cases, or at least the way that people think about it right now, they may already be earmarked for a funder. So it may be that one country took investment money, you know, off chain bilateral deal from another country, made the emission reduction outcomes and are are giving these back to the country for their investment. So there'll be bilateral stuff like that, where it'll just be direct country to country. Um, and you can do that, you can do a direct transfer on the Bitmo platform. However, what gets exciting is OpenSea actually already because these are ERC-1155, they're on Ethereum. You can use all of the tooling in OpenSea or your favorite sort of NFT marketplace that allows um, outside credits uh, to do auctions, to um, put stuff up for sale, have a declining price, all of these different things. Make it you know saleable to only one uh, address. Uh, all the rest. Um, and so I do believe that outside of these simple bilateral deals, um, countries will just bring stuff to market. And I do think that it's really exciting to think about how that can happen in the blockchain space and, and all of the um, ecosystem that's been built up around that. So I do believe that countries will, um, you know, issue, tokenize, and then put tons up for sale in a variety of different ways. And I think you know, with it being on chain, it kind of steers it in the way of, of crypto related folks um, to be able to play a part in that and to be able to put it into a pool and, and back Klima tokens with it, for example, is something that I'm so lit up and excited about. And then also just to bring it, you know, to the rest of the market. And uh, I think that every day we see more normies sort of more of the traditional world coming to crypto understanding it it gets easier to use people are willing to take the time to learn the the intricacies and i think you know climates rich large as a as a body of apes are are a great example that i have to imagine people come from varying levels of pre-existing technological crypto acumen but it's so compelling to learn about it that that we all dive in and, and learn a lot more um yeah but uh, there will be a lot. And so I think having another source of demand in the marketplace for demand, for BitMOs, just like we now have with Klima and BCTs in the voluntary market, um, I think is a very good thing. And I think that there is some maintaining of the sort of one of the goals of KlimaDAO stated goals is to sort of game stonk the carbon market and drive up the cost of 
offsets. And one way to look at that is that it makes it more expensive for people who are polluting to buy offsets, but it is sort of relying on the belief that they will continue to use that type of mechanism, um, which I think is is accurate to a certain extent. Um, I look at it, and so I think the same, well, really, so at least from the voluntary market, I think about it the other way, and I think it's also the same for ITMOs, is as, and this is maybe not surprising as a project developer, an offset project developer, when I see the price of carbon going up, I see real projects on the ground that I may have you know, been helping or, or looking at for years that were not feasible at lower carbon offset prices now become feasible. You know, I see ability to help communities, indigenous communities in Canada to gain more control and sovereignty and priority setting over how their landscapes are used because they're able to now pull together a carbon offset project paid for by these self-same voluntary offsets which sort of float in our sort of notional airy space here that really connects to real things on the ground and this is a fundamental plank of why i'm so excited proud bullish supporter and want to see Klimadao succeed is because it has absolutely driven up voluntary carbon offset prices. And that is absolutely letting new projects um, happen and flourish where they wouldn't. You know, right now we're buying up existing carbon credits, um, but it's creating a, you know, is it a, a suck, a negative pressure? You know, it's pulling um, people to get, you know, f- more subsequent years verified. It's getting people to really get going and and get going on new offset projects or ones that they've wanted to do for a long time. Um, So I think that's really exciting. This is fundamentally why the Bitmo platform, why we're doing this is because we know that if we can help speed up the the time to market to a carbon market and if we can make it more liquid if we can more make it more transparent by having the qualities of the carbon credit of the itmo transparently on the bitmo erc 1155 nft you can see it in our platform or you can go on OpenSea, and you can see all these characteristics you can sort these characteristics by doing that you enable people to trust the market you let more people into the market, you bring up the price, and you create a demand for all this good stuff on the ground. So that's why we do it. I think the way what you're talking about there is really just, you know, that ground truthing or the reality on the ground or the impact that Klima is having there. I think, you know, you know, a lot of climates or people investing in Klima will look and, you know, be justifiably happy about how many tons are on chain and how many tons are in the treasury. But I really just appreciate how you're, you know, bringing that um, you know, this is stuff that's making real world tangible impacts on actual projects, actual communities, actual ecosystems. That's that's really what you're illustrating there, Joseph, as the, the end goal and the point of the, this all, right? Exactly. That's really what it comes around to. And, you know, I have the benefit of coming to this space sort of through that space, um, but it's for real. And, you know, it. I, I clearly am lit up about it. It's clearly important to me. And I will say that when people you know, smack talk offsets or when people smack talk um, 2008 onwards verified carbon standard offsets, which are what Klima uses in the BCTs, um, it pisses me off because I know, you know, there's a, a variety of projects and they have a variety of different benefits. But to me, if you've gone through the Vera system, you are a high quality project and you've done real stuff on the ground. And, you know, when people look at and and you can look, I know the work of the Blockchain Infrastructure Carbon Offset Working Group um, and folks like Sarah Baxendale at Regen Network are doing really great work looking at, you know, what are the offsets that are in the BCTs. You can look and see these projects and see what they've achieved in the real world and look at their documentation and all of that stuff. So I think it's it's really profound and You know, I think I know people, you know, there's doubters, there's haters, there's sort of the whole nine. But I know that one of the ways I can help people understand it more closely like I do is to talk about the projects and to dig in and, you know, show what's happening, show how this money, this arcane, putting it on the blockchain, making Klima tokens is having boots on the ground, getting and keeping carbon out of the atmosphere. It's supporting communities. It's helping in many cases biodiversity and water and and the whole nine there. So um, it's really amazing that we get to have these rarefied, fascinating tools to do this with. But it's good to keep another foot on the ground um, and recognize why we're doing it. Yep. 100%. 
So I have this question. What do you see the carbon markets and or and klima would be like in 2033? Okay, the reason why it's 33 is because, you know, 33 is the our you know strategy in term in terms of the protocol. So that's the reason why it's 2033. But just like in the next 12 years, what do you expect to see the changes in the carbon market as well as what do you foresee uh, Klima is going to be like in 2033? I really appreciate the bringing the uh, the the three three tree tree um, into this and and sort of the game theory aspect and and everybody winning, right? Um, so twelve years is a long time, but it's also really not that long a time. Which I'm I'm learning more and more. And um, so in two zero three three, uh, will be a couple of years past the twenty thirty target date that a lot of countries have been stating their carbon. Um, commitments for. Um, I've been around long enough to see governments of all stripes, both earnestly and kind of fakely put out carbon targets, and they almost always miss them. And what happens is you get a couple years away from your five or 10 year old carbon market, and then you're like, oh, gee whiz, we're nowhere close to this, it's going to be too expensive to do it, can't do it. So why don't we increase it by another 10% and kick it out another decade or something like that. And it, you know, it, it drives me crazy. Um, and since we're on the topic, I think the best way to do this is actually have annual compliance periods, um, which people have in a cap and trade system. So if you're going to be, if we need to be 40% below, so Canada, for example, has around a 40% emission reduction target between now and 2030. So let's give it a couple extra years. That means a sort of averaged 4% per year emission reduction outcome. So, you know, we're almost at the end of this year. In a year, you know, can Canada have its emissions down 4% and in another year have it down 8% and another year have it down 12%. So it's hard, but it clarifies. And so I do believe that if people are making long-term carbon cap or sort of carbon target commitments that they also need to slice that up into one ton increments ideally put in trace in place the mechanisms to force that to happen but even if not even if it's just the source the social shaming aspect of it you got to have that transparency because otherwise you know we, humans have a hard time sort of work working until until the pressure's on so you need that pressure on every year and i do think that the answer to this question really does depend on humans humanity's ability to well to do exactly this to have some sort of cap and trade system but also fundamentally if you look at it another way it's have metrics and transparency married to real on the ground outcomes and i do think that bitmo can pay, play a really strong role in this i also think that klimadao can play a really strong role in this because you know there's clarity there's clarity that you know i think that there's 11 million tons of of carbon back in Klima right now. And so, you know, people can see that, people can see that fluctuate and there's an economic driver behind that. And so maybe that's a little bit of a stretch to how how the world's going to do it. Um, but I do think that they need to have that very clearly in place and blockchain enables that because of sort of the discrete one ton units the transparency enables that and i think having it more out there in the space i think having you know the thousands of climates that are going to hopefully listen to our podcast out there and aware of this really does turn up the pressure across so many different landscapes to to make sure that we really are setting these targets and and that we have a hope and heck of meeting them and that's not just by earnestly wishing it to happen. That's by building mechanisms. So I think in the case we can do that in two zero tree tree, we're going to be in an amazing spot. I think that humanity absolutely has it in them. I know that we have the technologies to do this. Like we have wafer panels that take power from the sun, man. We have windmills the size of football pitches. We can protect and restore forests. Like we got this. We have the technology necessary to solve the problem. What we have been missing, amongst other things, is economic tools to make that happen. And offsets are absolutely one of those tools. DeFi and crypto are absolutely a force multiplier on that tool. And, and with all these things together, I believe that we can make a real dent. And then in 2033, we've got 17 more years to 2050, which is when we need to have something between 80% reduction and net carbon neutrality. 
So it's pretty hardcore. There's a lot of stuff that's got to go on. And I think it's good to check in with with questions like this, like, what do you think about this year? I think however you feel about humanity's capacity to do this, the likelihood, the years, what I always encourage people is to like, then step back from that and sort of look at yourself and be like, do we want to solve this? Yes. Do we know we need to solve this? Yes. Is there something that I can do, either small or really big, um, or with high leverage to make that happen? Yes, great, let's do it. And um, you know, there's no, there's no way but forward on this. We can't go back. We have to go forward, and it's going to take everybody. And it's stuff like Klima, it's stuff like Planet of the Climates, helping get the word out to folks to understand this better, to you know, build trust and understanding and engagement around this that are going to be the things that get us there. Yeah, we, th- we definitely view it as a, a long-term commitment. I think that's what we try and encourage people in our community to look at this as a long-term commitment. In your mind, what, what does it take to get to kind of humanity unifying behind this mission? Because that's what I think really is the crux of an investment thesis into carbon markets is that this is a problem that needs to be solved. One of the solutions is a higher price of carbon. So so therefore we invest. And so, and that's clearly a long-term uh, investment, but to really kind of gain traction and start to make, I guess, real change to these hard reductions that you're talking about that do have costs. They have costs to the, the uh, industries, they have costs to the end users. But when we prioritize that, we say that that's acceptable because we need to do that. Uh, in your mind, where's the inflection point where humanity sort of rallies behind this goal? Is it sort of when it's too late? Is it when can we get get the message out to a broader group of people and and have it take hold? What are your thoughts on that? I honestly believe that Article 6, as people wrap their head around it and as projects get underway, is kind of, it's quite magical because how I view Article 6 is um, it is a system to enable capital to flow from wherever there's capital fundamentally married with demand for emission reduction outcomes and with a global system and with sort of the tooling, the project developers, the know-how, the capacity building, the capital, the organization, that money can flow from where there's money and demand to where there's projects to get or keep carbon out of the atmosphere on the ground. And where that's sort of been siloed, you know, if there's been sort of national protectionism or provincial protectionism around that, where it's just sort of hard to understand stuff across the world, maybe we need some more organization. With Article 6, like no word of a lie, if money can flow from, you know, there's lots of money in the world and there is a lot of opportunities to get and keep carbon out of the atmosphere in the world, a lot of them that are not even that expensive, a lot of them that actually help save, you know, the proponent's money, but that still aren't getting done because of cultural reasons or technological reasons or know-how reasons. And so once, you know, as we smooth this out as we have these structures, as we have ways to inject, you know, money and you sort of additional demand into the system like DeFi, like Klima, that I think is going to be the thing because, you know, I would say yeah, we're all still in our own bubbles, but I would say that people are more on board now than 10 years ago to address climate change. They're more on board like than three years ago, quite honestly. Um, and so people want to be climate change. So if you take that, um, so I think that's a truth. You take that there is a lot of money in the world. That's a truth. You take that there's a lot of opportunities to get or keep carbon out of the atmosphere. And moreover, there's a lot of people who have these potential projects, you know, who have a degraded landscape that they would really like to restore, um, you know, for the plants, for the animals, for the watershed. People have old growth forests that are at threat of being cut down and that are sort of getting put in the crosshairs and and communities are having to make a choice. Do we keep getting logging revenue when we don't have a lot of other revenues or do we protect it and get nothing if they're able to get carbon offset money from doing that protection and proving that protection? Point being, there there's so much opportunity and so much compelling need for ways to fund this work around the world. And I think that Article 6 and carbon markets can do that. And where that can happen, the interesting thing about pricing, and, you know, it's kind of a whole nother arc, but there is a lot, you know, I think those last tons may take a lot, but there is so much that can be done. So people think it's a really expensive issue. Yes. And it is, but there is so much that can be done at low costs per ton if the system is there and in place and smooth running to enable that. So I think, um, 
yeah, I think if that can help defray people's concern from the point of view that oh, this money will never sort of come to bear or, you know, the powers that be will never, you know, let it really cost industry that much. Um, I think even within those realities, you know, as we're changing them, um, a, a ton can be done. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. This has been uh, a whirlwind tour from, you know, the behind the scenes stuff about how uh, blockchain for climate was founded, the technology you're leveraging to the boots and the roots on the ground that are going to make the real positive impact over the coming years and decades here too. Um, yeah, I don't know for uh, Reg and Diamond Hands, but I think that's that's kind of it for our questions. Really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure. And I, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to really shout out my team in the Blockchain for Climate Foundation. We're sort of up on the website. There's around 20 of us, mostly vol largely volunteer, that have been working on this big and small for a long time. My team at Ecotrust Canada that's engaged in this, allowing this to happen, being a good um, sort of charitable home for aspects of this work. Blockchain for Climate Foundation is a not-for-profit, um, which we do think is the right model to create something that all the countries of the world can, can come and be a part of. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that not exactly sure when we're coming out, but Gitcoin Grants is on right now. Um, and amazing, I, I won't even call it experiment, an amazing fa foundation and establishment in quadratic funding, in really allowing people to have their say, both with their dollars and with simply their, their human voice about what gets funded by these matching pools. So you can find us in the under the climate tab. Um, you can search Bitmo if you're looking for us and uh, really love folks support there. It's it's a really exciting thing to be a part of. And thank you so much for Planet of the Climates, to all the climates, um, to the Klimadao team, uh, to all the contributors to Klima. It's just so darn exciting and so inspiring and uh, really honored and touched to get to be a part of it. That's That's just awesome, Joseph. Really, really thank you very much, Joseph. It has been a really eye-opening experience, uh, or rather mind-opening experience, uh, because it's uh, I've never really studied much about carbon markets, and whatever you shared with me really just made me, okay, I, I want to dive a, little, a bit deeper on what you, you, sh you shared. I mean, I'm going to listen to this podcast like a few times to really understand all the things you talk about, because, yeah, really, really amazing. Really, really appreciate you taking out time from your busy schedule to talk to the three of us i can't be more thankful absolute pleasure guys look forward to uh to listening to this and continuing to listen to your shows and and uh seeing you guys around the space wow what a great conversation Easy to see why Joseph and his Blockchain for Climate Foundation have become central to accelerating action on the Paris Agreement. Just so much wisdom that he just dropped right there for you and for us at the Planet of the Climates. Now, I don't know about you two, uh, Reg and Diamond Hands, but uh, I was just so impressed with what he had to say. Uh, how about some of your key takeaways there, Reg? Yeah, I think uh, my key takeaway was um, the, the long-term commitment to this process of bringing carbon on chain, establishing trust with the communities, governments, industry. It, it, he's been building this for several years and uh, what he's achieved is incredible so far. He's clearly partnered with Klima. You know, he's a community member. He has uh, Klima's interests in mind, but I, I think uh, the long-term uh, vision, you know, he's thinking 10 years, he's thinking 20 years out. I think it's really confidence inspiring for people in the Klima community um, that we have people like this on our side. And so I learned a lot. I'm definitely going to listen to this podcast a few times. Yes. Um, and um, yeah, Diamond Hands, how about yourself? Likewise, I'm going to listen. There's really a lot of knowledge, a lot of technical terms that uh, definitely I have to listen a few more times to really get the whole idea in. I'm personally not an expert when it comes to carbon markets in general and uh, because of uh, the exposure I have to Klima uh, right now I'm really looking to deep uh, into like being sustainable and I feel that end of the day uh, the, the, the key takeaway if you ask me right that's that 
um, you know, in the past when you talk about carbon uh, being car- carbon neutral or to be, to be able to offset your carbon, it's always been a, a big word. Like it's never easy for someone in retail, like my, like for us, like men on the street, to be able to offset our carbon. But with what he's shared, what he has mm. shared, and going forward, uh, it seems like you don't have to be rich to offset your carbon, or rather, you can start to have sustainable. Mm. Uh, kind of investments uh, going forward as well whereby your carbon your offsets um, your investments with Klima will be uh, potentially be able to fund for big projects and be part of, and be part of a greater cause not just yourself but also the people around you as well yeah Joseph if you're listening and I hope you're listening I'm sure definitely we'd love to have you back to talk more about Bitmos as those first uh, Itmos and Bitmos get uh, minted and brought on chain we'd love to hear a little progress report on that and get your take on the carbon markets uh, again in the future for sure Um, yeah I I think I probably have pretty similar takeaways to you two but uh, perhaps the story that Joseph told that resonated with me the most or just blew my mind the most was just his little story about hanging out in this uh, uh, Vancouver basement or this Vancouver underground NFT club with, um, you know, the CryptoKitties folks and Dapper Labs and all that. And that idea that that was the genesis or, or that was when um, the, the bell or the light went off for Joseph about what could happen with blockchain for Climate Foundation and the Bitmos. It was just such a cool story. And it is, again, about, you know, c- community and these you know, unseen opportunities. So you're saying, okay, well, now I can take these characteristics and traits of your uh, crypto kitties and I can turn that into, you know, the characteristics and the vintages and the provenance and the verification of carbon credits. I mean, it's just wild. So cool. Um, yeah, so that's that's it for the show for today. Hope you really enjoyed that conversation with Joseph Pallant. For everything Klima, make sure you're hitting up klimadao.finance where you can stake, bond, and perhaps most importantly, find a link to the Klima Discord community. As a decentralized autonomous organization, Klima is community-driven just like this very podcast. So join us and you'll find a great group of climates and plenty of opportunities to contribute and be an active climate yourself too. So we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Joseph. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to the next Planet of the Climates.